very good evening to all of you and thank you dhruvi for such kind words thank you dr chawla sir and shalini ma'am for inviting me to this prestigious event and this wonderful evening i'm sharing the type 1 symposium with dr partha and dr unikrishnan senona so with your kind permission if you allow me to share my slides so as very rightly said and i think we have all already heard dr unikrishnan and his talk on monogenic diabetes and with partha talking about the adjuvant therapies in type 1 diabetes it's time that we really understand that it's not always type 1 when a young diabetic is in your chamber so we must give it a thought properly that actually is it type 1 or are we dealing with something else so why are we coming to this question that is it type 1 actually a type 1 because what the recent years have given us that the young diabetics are increasing in number and in prevalence across the globe so now anybody below 20 coming to your chamber with high sugars may not necessarily be type 1 so what are the repercussions of this diagnosis not being type 1 the repercussions go a long way because now what we are talking of is actually an early onset of maybe type 2 or it may be something else that we come to later on that translates to increasing mortality and morbidity increasing cardiovascular complications increasing cerebrovascular complications increased number of dialysis maybe later on because of the esrds or the increasing blindness and as a result a huge loss to the economy of any country for that matter so what are the unique challenges the unique challenges being that we are so used to managing a middle aged diabetic type 2 that we actually forget to consider a young diabetic being something anything else other than being a type 1 so we forget to diagnose we forget to treat and we actually forget to even think so this is time when we realize that any young diabetic population may not be type 1 with the increasing number of type 1 or with the increasing number of children being diabetic we realize that those still the type 1 predominates in number but type 2 prevalence is quickly catching up and we have a huge number of children with type 2 diabetes now why is it important to differentiate because of the rapidly decri- declining beta cells early onset of complications younger children being type 2 diabetic means they have a longer life to live with diabetes and its complications we have a huge economic burden on any country for that matter we have to consider the genetics here and the genes also and the gender also it may not be type 1 it may not be modi it may not be lada but it may be type 2 this is one of the interesting studies which was conducted between type 1 versus type 2 in adolescents and after looking at the entire data the research question actually was that what about the prevalence of diabetes related complications and this was really interesting to understand that if you look at the complication rate in type 1 versus type 2 the complication rates are higher in type 2 with young onset if you look at this data there is an increasing incidence of type 1 by the data or by the numbers of 1.8% per year but the increase in the number of type 2 is almost 4.8% per year with this speed of increase in type 2 no sooner we will have that the number is catching up and we will have more of type 2 in children rather than the type 1 in children look at the complication rates may it be micro or the macrovascular complications you will find that in the data in type 2 the complication rate is pretty higher in type 2 children as compared to the type 1 children so if we look at the data in the sweden study you will find that though still the 75% of the prevalence was of type 1 but we had almost 20% type 2 children and still another variant that is 6% was from secondary diabetes now what do we understand with secondary diabetes secondary diabetes can be secondary to a uh, fibrocalcific pancreas or it can be something else it can be some syndrome it can be modi 
or it can be ilada so if you look at the diabetes in young and another way of the another way of classifying the disease or another way of looking at the children in your chamber with high sugars maybe type 1 will have a share of 40% type 2 will have a share of equal prevalence that is 40% again some can be 50 some can be say fcpd that is fibrocalcemic pancreas or it can be flatbush diabetes which is a ketosis prone diabetes it can be modi or it can be mitochondrial diabetes that is some syndromic diabetes if you look at the clinical features differentiating the various types of course type 1 will be the patient who will require insulin right from the onset they will be lean children and they will present somewhere quite early family history will be absent they will be lean markers of insulin resistance such as acanthosis overweight or some skin tags will be absent c peptide levels almost negligible or not detectable not detectable they will be autoimmune or autoantibodies positive whereas the type 2 children right from the onset will have overweight family history the stigmata of insulin resistance c peptides high that is hyperinsulinemic children and autoantibodies will be definitely absent monogenic diabetes dr krishnan has uni krishnan has already discussed in details but we are just summarizing here that type uh, monogenic children will be the children who will present sometime earlier than 25 years with a presenting history of three generations positive hyperglycemia but not significant they will be moderately hyperglycemic might respond to ohs family history three generations as i talked obesity not usually they'll be just well built c peptides lower than normal antibodies negative markers of insulin resistance absent fcpd or the secondary diabetes again detected sometime later in 20s family history of course absent there will be the lean population with no marker of insulin resistance present c peptides will be negligible so this population will be requiring insulin again and the antibodies will be negative so presence of antibodies lead us to type 1 diabetes presence of family history and obesity lead us to type 2 presence of family history but lean population favors monogenic lean population absent antibodies absent c peptide lead us to fcpd so these are the broad clinical markers so coming to type 1 diabetes the incidence still is the highest in children and mostly the children will present somewhere around above 5 years until puberty most of them will have auto antibodies and the most commonly prevalent antibodies being the gab antibodies but it can also be insulin antibodies or the iron cell antibodies or the zinc transporter 8 now these antibodies may be present even before the children is hyper they are hyperglycemic that is before the disease is clinically over but now this uh, point is more important for the screening of siblings maybe or the screening of the first degree relatives but not right from the index case because that case usually present to us once the child has already been diagnosed with hyperglycemia but we can find out the sibling status from this test though how can we prevent it further from becoming over is still not known then there is another class where you will find the antibodies absent so this is the class of type 1 b diabetes that is idiopathic type 1 diabetes they are not autoimmune but the clinical presentation is almost the same so now a new consensus from jdrf is that there are staging of type 1 so we have stage 1 where we have the autoimmunity present but the children are still normoglycemic that is clinically not present the hyperglycemia not present then we have the stage 2 where the children become dysglycemic and then finally there is stage 3 when they become symptomatic hyperglycemic and just taking up from here we also have something called pre stage 1 where you can detect the presence of autoimmunity or autoantibodies but still the children are not diabetic so they have the genetic predisposition and they might turn type 1 but they are still not autoimmune 
They are not showing the evidence of antibodies or not showing the evidence of high sugars. Differentiating type 1 and type 2 once again. So type 2 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, you will have hyperinsulinemic level. There's increased C-peptide levels, no antibodies present, a strong family history. Mostly you will find that the entire family shares almost the same shape and size because they share the same table and they also share the same lifestyle. So they are usually obese with almost all the stigmata of insulin resistance like hypertension, acanthosis, skin tags, and the women or the, uh, the young girls presenting with PCOD. So what are the risk factors? Now there was one another interesting topic which I recently presented. What are the modifiable, non-modifiable risk factors or what are the non-modifiable, modifiable risk factors? So again, here I will just mention one word that the difference between modifiable and non-modifiable law is also getting blurred. Most of these modifiable risk factors, which we count as obesity, sedentary lifestyle, low physical activity or socioeconomic status, they are all becoming eventually and slowly they're turning into the non-modifiable ones because we are just not doing anything about them. And the non-modifiable, of course, we can't do much about them. So they still remain non-modifiable, but now we are trying with the gene therapies to make them modifiable. So how does type 2 children differ from type 1? Firstly, all type 2 children are not necessarily insulin resistant always. There are certain subgroups of children who do have impaired insulin secretion along with insulin resistance. So now, why don't we call them type 1? because they don't have antibodies, because they are not ketosis prone, because they will not lose their life if not put on insulin. So they will have a small drink type of life, lifespan. There is compensatory response to insulin resistance in different ethnic groups. There can be children presenting with hyperglycemic non-ketotic comas, and you can save them. They may not, they, that may not be fatal, but they require insulin in low dosing or they at least require management of hyperglycemia. Now, this is the class where I was talking, there is some component of decreased insulin resistance, insulin secretion along with insulin resistance. So now this is one term which we have colloquially placed as double diabetes, though we don't have any FDA approval or ADA approval of this term as double diabetes. These are the children who have insulin resistance as well as insulin deficiency. So they are the class of children who have uh, been on insulin, but now they are obese or who are obese, but requiring insulin to manage their blood sugars. Monogenic diabetes, we have already discussed with Dr. Ranjit Krishna. So it is about young, less than 25 years, Presenting to us with hyperglycemia, autosomal dominant in inheritance, three generations positive, may or may not be requiring insulin, but they are not obese, not autoimmune. So these are the Modi variants and we have a huge list of Modi variants here. They are the non-ketotic, young onset. Primarily, there is a beta cell dysfunctioning. There are more than six types or even there's a huge list now, but the six predominant types they are precipitated by some insulin sensitivity also. Typical presentation remains, they are mildly hyperglycemic, asymptomatic, non-obese, young population with prominent family history. So Modi as compared to type two, you will find the penetrance. The penetrance is very high in Modi, whereas in type two, it is variable. Body habitus, they are non-obese people. Syndromics, no, they are not syndromic children. Inheritance is autos autosomal dominant, younger in onset, less than 25 years, and the pedigree will show uh, at least a minimum of three generation involvement. Phenotypic expression we have already discussed. So the most common types are the six variants that we have been discussing, though we have a huge list now. Then moving on to some more chromosomal variants, some more genetic variants, we have the uh, some syndromic variants like the Wolfram syndrome, also known as the Didmot syndrome, where we have the diabetes insipidus with diabetes mellitus, with optic atrophy and deafness. So they are the Wolfram or the mitochondrial diseases. Then we have the Elstrom syndrome, 
where we have obesity associated with hyperglycemia. Again, these are the children with also growth hormone deficient and their short statured obese and diabetic children. Another class is the cystic fibrosis, where you have to start looking for hyperglycemia right from the diagnosis. Eventually, all cystic fibrotic children will end up with hyperglycemia and diabetes. So you have to manage the pulmonary dysfunctioning, but along with pulmonary dysfunctioning, you have to keep looking for hyperglycemia. Coming to the FCPD variants, the FCPD variants and the diagnostic criteria were given to us by none other than our own Dr. Mohan. And as per these criteria, the patient should be from a tropical country, hyperglycemic, chronic pancreatic evidence must be present radiologically, and we should have absence of other causes of chronic pancreatitis like alcoholism or hepatobiliary diseases. So if we have these four criteria which are met, then it's a FCPD variant. FCPD variant is another type which is ketosis resistance. So there is no ketosis and besides being absence of ketosis is another feature that FCPD variant do not have microvascular complications. Then we have the young diabetics as LADA. Now this is autoimmune positive variant but presenting a little late. So there's latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. So adults, hyperglycemic, but autoimmune. So this is how do we differentiate? These are the LADA variants. They will have autoantibodies positive. They are thin built and will be requiring insulin right from the beginning. Initial six months, you may buy by putting them on OHAs, but eventually after six months, they will be on insulin. So the diagnostic criteria is anytime before 50, Acute symptoms, BMI, they are lean people, autoimmune diseases present, family history of autoimmune diseases also present. General characteristics, again, putting up the same features, young, thin, autoimmune, requiring insulin right from the beginning. If you just screen them, GADA positive, GADA negative, if they get positive or get negative, if they get positive, we measure the C peptide. And if the C peptide is less than 0.3, we start with insulin. If the C peptide is more than 0.7, you can put them on OHS for some time. If the C peptide is between 0.3 and 0.7, then the diagnostic criteria becomes the atherosclerotic diseases. If the atherosclerotic disease is established, start with insulin. If the atherosclerotic disease is absent, you can choose your OHA for the time being. So this is about the LADA and the various types. Then as my time is running up, I believe somebody just interrupted me. So we will not be touching on the neonatal diabetes, but otherwise this is also one of the variants where children may not be type 1. Neonatal diabetes can be transient or permanent or syndromic again. Then the last slide, how do we approach hyperglycemic young uh, patient, you will have to look for family history. If the family history is positive, three generations, likely Modi. Absent, fam absent of three generation, but a family history positive, along with a well obese, well-built patient with high C-peptide, likely type 2. Family history negative and ketone urea also negative, C-peptide absent. Probably we are dealing with some syndromic types, genetic types. But if the ketone urea is positive, C-peptide absent, autoantibodies positive, we are likely dealing with type 1. Or if we have absence of C-peptide, but pancreatic calculi present, probably we are dealing with the fibrocalculus pancreatic diabetes. So these are the broad types when you have to consider when you are dealing with a young diabetic population. Do not just dismiss them all as type 1. So with that, I rest my presentation. Thank you so much. And once again, thank you, House, for inviting me here. Dr. Chavla, sir, Shalini, ma'am, thank you so much for the honor.